would love for you to introduce yourself. All right, hello everyone. Can you guys hear me well? Great. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's my honor uh, to be invited to this uh, wonderful event. I want to thank uh, Carlos Galindo, my tocayo, uh, Andrea Trigatti, Liz Casiria at Center Stage, and the Futura and KDP Student Organizations for having me here. Um, so, uh, I'm a musician, I'm a scholar, and I try to be a combination of these two things. I, in my work, I try to combine both uh, performance, composition, and uh, the research that I do um, on different types of music around the world, especially with an emphasis uh, on Latin America. So I will begin this presentation and I think uh, I will take, uh, take off my headphones uh, so I can uh, kind of play with more uh, ease. If I will uh, wait until the end of the presentation to open uh, the forum for questions, if you guys want to ask uh, Don Pedro, Un gusto verlo. Um, um, so I will um, uh, leave some minutes open to talk with you and then I, you know, I will uh, wear my headphones once again so I can hear your voices, all right? Um, okay. So um, I was uh, asked to share my music, my music and my research in this presentation. And I thought that what I was uh, wanted to do at this at this time was to talk about uh, um, the huge and rich diversity of uh, musical elements that can be found in Latin America, and, and I I will use my own music, my own composition to demonstrate some of these elements. I thought that that will be more fun in terms of engaging you know, uh, culture and diversity through performance, which are one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm kind of focused to, to do uh, in my career. So I will begin with the presentation and this will involve a lot of uh, things pertaining to my own life because this is my music uh, and, and um, this music has kind of uh, developed throughout my, uh, the, throughout my experience living in, in different places and learning about different types of music and dealing and, and, and working with a variety of musicians. Okay, so I will um, share my screen. Okay. I feel kind of weird without my headphones, so I will put them back. I've been teaching for so long uh, via Zoom that now this is part of my body, almost. Okay, so music in Latin America, a constellation of cultures. Uh, I've done this presentation several times in different places and I always tweak uh, the way in which I talk about this idea of a constellation of cultures in relation to the, to the, the common aspects that shape uh, cultures in Latin America. Uh, if we think about the, the common historical elements that have shaped countries and societies in Latin America. But the, the cool thing about this is that this diversity or these uh, uh, similar historical patterns have led to diversity, uh, to um, manifest the, this diversity in different types of sounds, different musical styles, different genres. Okay. So a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Lima, Peru. I grew up there. I uh, studied music when I was uh, a teenager and got in, kind of uh, started to develop a, a close relationship with uh, Latin American folklore and uh, the rich tradition of folklore in Latin America, especially in, in, in South America. I study guitar uh, in Peru, and also uh, when I was finishing high school, uh, discovered this beautiful music known uh, as jazz, right? Which became one of the one of my um, passions after I finished high school, and that was one of the reasons uh, 
that brought me here to the U.S. My my uh, my dream of uh, learning to play jazz and to play with uh, jazz musicians. Right. So I st studied Peruvian folk music and guitar in Peru, and then I moved to the U.S. when I was in my twenties. And so, since my of course since my years growing up in Peru. Uh, my journey uh, as a human being has been deeply shaped by music uh, and in many different ways, not only at a professional level. Uh, I think uh, at this point in my life, I know that music has really directed me to the many diff different places where I've lived, uh, the different people I, I've, uh, I've, I've uh, known and, and so forth. So really my journey has been defined by, by the magic, the power, the beauty of music. Uh, and this journey involved different influences, right? For example, Brazilian music, which I discovered actually uh, more deeply when I moved to the US, even though Peru, it's, uh, we're in neighborhoods with Brazil, but uh, Brazilian music has been a, a huge influence in my, in my journey through music. Flamenco music also, since um, flamenco, uh, style, the flamenco style to play the guitar, it's uh, very uh, popular in Latin America because of the, the influence of, of hundreds of years uh, in which uh, most, uh, most of the Latin American re region, you know, uh, comprise of colonies uh, from, from Spain, Spanish colonies. So the, the presence of the classical guitar and the flamenco guitar it's, it's huge in uh, Latin American folklore. Even if guitar players don't play necessarily flamenco, the techniques used to, to play the guitar come almost directly from the world of classical guitar and flamenco guitar. And of course, other, uh, other styles of music that have been uh, part of my journey has been jazz, fusion, heavy metal when I was uh, finishing high school. I, uh, I think this was music that helped me to uh, express some of the intense uh, emotions uh, and feelings that as a teenager sometimes, you know, we feel. And also music, more lately, um, film scores have been very important in developing my, my idea about how music can uh, interact with, with uh, people in terms of their emotions. So a lot of the music that I play, as hopefully you'll, you'll hear today, uh, attempts to create different emotions, different moods in, in, in the listener. And finally, Afro-Peruvian music, uh, the tradition of, of Afro-Peruvian music was my, uh, kind of my, my, the window through which I access uh, the incredibly important uh, legacy of Afro-derived uh, music and cultures in Latin America and beyond. If you think about, you know, the, the, the current state of affairs uh, in, in terms of pop music around the world, popular music around the world has been influenced tremendously by Afro-derived music. Any genre that, that you can think about, rock, pop, rap, uh, hip hop, reggae, all these genres have been influenced by Afro-derived music. So the, the legacy is there and it's, it's alive. Okay. Um, so when I moved to the U.S. in my 20s, I discovered this term, which maybe I heard when I was in Peru, but I never kind of thought about it in, in, a, in a kind of in a critical way, Latin music. When I, I came to the U.S., I started to listen to the, this label, this uh, way to, to refer to different types of music, Latin music. And I didn't know exactly what was this, but I started to use this label to describe my own music and my work because that uh, was the way to go when you try to find gigs and performances and you want to be booked as a musician, you want to be able to describe what you do, right? So I found that this term was used by most uh, Hispanic musicians here. So I, I said, I'm gonna use it. But then I started thinking, what is this uh, Latin music, right? And uh, after some years of, you know, playing music, learning, you know, to play other types of music and getting to know more musicians in the U.S., I, I, I decided that it was uh, within my place as, a, as an educator, I thought that it was important to seek ways to talk about the diversity that can be found within 
uh, this label, Latin music. I thought that I knew from my own experience that Latin music really encompasses a huge diversity of things, a constellation of music cultures, right? So um, a lot of, of what I've done as, a, as an educator, a musician, has been to explore creatively, but also to uh, teach other people about the diversity that can be found within this very succinct uh, idea of Latin music, right? So I wanted to find and, and uh, also to talk about diversity uh, um, in Latin America as an expression of this constellation of cultures. So let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean with this term constellation of cultures, since it's, it's kind of the, the, the core aspect of this presentation. Okay? And I will use some images, which I, I, in the past have helped me to express what I mean uh, with this term or this phrase. Okay. So when I, when I think about Latin American music, oh, actually, let's, let's take a look to a couple of um, definitions first to have our definitions clear. Uh, when we talk about Latin American music, typically, we uh, talk about musical traditions of Mexico, Central America, and the portions of South America and the Caribbean colonized by the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Uh, these traditions reflect the distinctive mixtures of Native American, African, and European influences that have shifted throughout the region over time. This is very important. We see uh, similar sources, Native American, African, and European, but the outcome of this mixture has been different in every country, and through time, these have, sh have morphed and changed into different sonic expressions, right? And this is a uh, definition by uh, Gerard Bihaig, who is one of the most important Latin Americanists and ethnomusicologists. Um, and now uh, let's take a look to Latin music. So when we talk about Latin music, when we use this term, the first thing that we need to know is that it was created and coined by the music industry. Uh, it's an umbrella term. So there is, uh, when you uh, use this, um, this concept of Latin music, I mean, we are really referring to a lot of different genres and subgenres. And uh, the term started to be uh, used in, in, the in 1975 when the Grammy Awards created the best Latin recording category. It was the very first one uh, introduced by the Grammy Awards. And this, uh, the creation of this award uh, involved a lot of controversy because there were hundreds, thousands of amazingly skilled Hispanic musicians who were kind of thinking about, all right, so just one, one award for all this huge diversity, it was very limiting, right? Uh, through time, these things, of course, have changed. Now the Grammy Awards have a specific uh, set of awards for uh, Latin music, right? But this is kind of uh, the origins of um, the term Latin music. All right, so now let's talk about this constellation of cultures, this, uh, this diversity. When I think about Latin America, I, I see this uh, constellation of different uh, countries, every country having different regions, every region having a distinctive folklore and different forms of sonic expressions, right? But these are not isolated. These are interconnected communities, right? Um, for example, uh, different uh, music, music from different countries have influenced other countries in Latin America. So there is interconnection and not isolation in terms of how uh, culture travels from one region to another uh, in Latin America. Starting with the fact that uh, most of uh, Latin American countries share the same language, right? Spanish, which is uh, it's one of the most important platforms to, to exchange you know, culture and ideas. So these countries, more than 30 countries in Latin America have their own culture, their own traditions, and yes, they have similar historical origins, but they are also interconnected. And this video shows that kind of, that aspect that I, 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 uh, I always like to, to, to point out 
that these are countries that are interconnected through similar historical origins, language, and uh, uh, also a few similar patterns, patterns in terms of how folklore has been created in these countries. Okay, now let's move to the idea of um, the constellation itself. This is how this idea came to my mind when thinking about uh, Latin American cultures. So if we look at the sky at night, when there's a clear sky, we'll see uh, hundreds and thousands of stars, planets, and, and, and celestial bodies you know, uh, covering the sky. This is the diversity that permeates everything. Uh, some people might be able to, from uh, the first minute, to see all this diversity. Other people might not perceive the diversity that is in the sky with all these planets, but it's there, right? I think diversity permeates everything in our world, uh, in, in our planet. So, but when we stop and we uh, take a minute to uh, start to observe without preconceived ideas, the diversity that we see in the sky, these millions of stars and planets, we will start to identify certain patterns, right? We see some planets, some uh, uh, stars closer to, you know, other groups of stars, and then we uh, suddenly start to identify patterns. And uh, I believe that the patterns that we identify in this original diversity reflect who we are as, as human beings, right? So when we start to identify those patterns, we see the constellation, right? So a constellation, I define a constellation as a temporal process, a visualization of a fluid structure that allows interconnection, diversity, and change. Uh, however, these patterns are temporal. We see them only because we want to see them, right? And because these patterns reflect, in a sense, the viewer, reflects our aspirations, our hopes, our place on earth, our place in uh, this existence, right? So I think uh, culture works in a very similar way, not only in Latin America, but everywhere in the world. In terms of Latin America, well, as I mentioned you know, at the beginning of the presentation, what I like to see is this constellation of different uh, cultural centers, different regions that interconnect with each other, nourishing each other and leading to innovation, to the creation of new music, new sounds, new ways of expressing that are also, of course, shaped by uh, what happens in our world uh, in, in today, right? So um, Latin America really has this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity of, of having so much diversity in terms of all these all the countries that can be found in the region and each of these country uh, featuring a, a, a rich um, musical legacy. Okay, so this is kind of uh, the way in which I like to talk about uh, the constellation of cultures in Latin America. And now I would like to move to my music and the way in which I process these things through my own creative activity. Um, so what I will be doing is I will play a few of my compositions today, and I will talk about elements that I have incorporated into my compositions precisely from all this uh, constellation of diversity, th this constellation of cultures that can be found in, the, uh, uh, in Latin America in terms of folklore and music. And hopefully throughout this, you know, uh, throughout me mentioning these elements, the, the, the diversity and the interconnection of music in Latin, in Latin America will be uh, evident, right? Um, okay, so let's start with the first uh, piece that I plan to perform today. And this is called Montuno Negro. Um, all right, so a few things about this, uh, this composition. The word Montuno uh, refers to this final section of a song. Uh, it's, a, it's a ostinato pattern 
that uh, started to be used, uh, as far as I know, in Cuba um, to provide a semi-improvised and high energy section at the end of uh, a composition, right? So initially this term Montuno was used in Cuba, but now it's, it's pervasive in Latin American music. If you think about salsa, for instance, salsa uses Montuno, Montuno patterns to, uh, for improvisations and such. It's usually placed at the end of a song, something that we can describe as a coda, right? An added section at the end of a composition. And, but Montuno also was used in Cuba to refer uh, to someone who comes from the mountain, from a rural area. Something perhaps, someone perhaps uneducated, but, but someone who is uh, um, really permeated with uh, life in rural sites, in, in the countryside, and the folklore associated to, to these uh, rural regions. So it's, the Montuno is, is associated to rural music, and perhaps because of that, uh, it's usually faster, brusher, and semi-improvised. And also, as I mentioned before, this is a repetitive pattern that, has, that uh, is comprised of a simple harmonic idea or an ostinato. So just to give you an, uh, uh, an example of how that works, uh, you take, for example, three chords and you play a montuno in uh, A minor. So my three chords are A, B, and E7. When I, I, when I add the chords and the bass line, it sounds like this. percussion instruments, they create a rich texture over which uh, instrumentalists improvise, right? So for this tool, Montuno Negro, I did research and listened to a lot of different ways in which uh, this Montuno has been uh, used in different types of Latin American music. And I thought that uh, the Montuno was such an intrinsic part of music and culture in Latin America that I wanted to explore my own way to use this device in my music. So I created this, this song uh, in part exploring the use of Montuno uh, patterns. And you will hear um, kind of in the middle of this piece uh, the, the, the presence of this Montuno um, almost as a form of bridge in the middle of the song. So here's Montuno Negro. You guys hear the guitar well?
that I brought exploring this the, the pervasive presence of montunos in Latin American music, which as, as I said before, <clears throat> began in the, in the Caribbean, but then spread to many different areas in Latin America and, and was finally uh, kind of appropriated in different Latin American genres. Okay, let's take a look to the next song, uh, and this is called uh, song for Alma. Alma is my uh, oldest daughter. She's now uh, 10. And I initially wrote this song as a lullaby for her. And so the, f the first inspiration in terms of the music uh, came uh, when writing this song came from a um, traditional Afro-Peruvian style known as panalivio, right? So panalivio, it, it's, um, some people describe it in, in Peru as a, as a kind of uh, Peruvian blues. It, it's uh, music that was created by the Afro-Peruvian community uh, probably in the 19th century. And of course it has evolved a lot, uh, it has changed in many ways, but it has a, a very distinctive and simple percussive and rhythmic pattern uh, as its backbone. And it goes something like this. Let's see if you can hear that. So it's a very simple pattern that you can play in the guitar like this. So I began with that idea uh, using, using that uh, rhythmic motif for this song. And, but the panalivio in Peru was inspired uh, on other type of music also coming from Cuba, the Cuban habanera, right? That it has also a distinctive pattern that goes like this. So the, the habanera is one of the most probably the most famous uh, uh, Latin American styles uh, um, around the world, I would say, or the, one of the most influential. So, but the, the Afro-Peruvian community used elements of this habanera to, to develop the panalivio. And so I, I mentioned that the panalivio sometimes is described as uh, the Afro-Peruvian blues. It is also described as a mento negro, a black cry. And mainly because um, musicians approach this style of music as a kind of a healing element. It was music that was intended to alleviate suffering, to heal people, especially because we're talking about the Afro-Peruvian community 
and they were they were you know uh, enslaved. They were you know people who who suffered a lot. You know the, the pressure of the times during during colonial times. So this music uh, uh, emerged as an effort to bring uh, you know healing to these to these communities. Uh, so all these things kind of uh, influenced my thinking in. Uh, uh, about the music of this song, and I came out with this uh, interpretation that I'll, I'll play for you right now. This is Song for Alma. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Gracias, Andrea. Um, great. So that was um, Song for Alma. Hey, Carlos, I, I stopped sharing your screen when you started playing uh, so that people could see you play the oh, guitar. Okay. 
So you can share again, you know, if you're gonna go to another slide. And then when you start playing, I'll just take it off again. That'll be, that'll be great. Thank you okay. very much. It's <laughs> no so one thing, you know, less from my job. Yeah, right I can, you can share it and I can take it off when you start playing that way. Yeah. That way you can take care of your Thank music. you, that, that, that'd be very <laughs> helpful. You should see my, my screen right now. I have two screens with five software right okay. now going on, so, uh, okay. And I also, um, maybe I should say something uh, right now about um, how I, ap I approach my, um, my creative process, right? Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to show is how I, I um, how I take elements, distinctive elements that I found in different genres uh, in Latin America and I like to, to just play with these elements in the same way that, that a, a, a painter or, or a visual artist play with, you know, her materials to create something new that expresses, you know, her, her, uh, her creativity, her essence as a human being. That's something that I, I uh, also like to do, to take elements that uh, I find interesting and inspiring and to mix them with other elements. And this sometimes, um, you know, when we think about music and folklore, you know, the idea of tradition is very important. And, but also tradition, depending on how you approach this, this idea, can be restrictive, right? Um, in my own case, um, um, I, I like to approach tradition as um, the artist kind of, um, the, the artist uh, imperative of making this tradition evolve and change and develop into new, uh, into new uh, types of music that reflect uh, our contemporary world, right? In my own case, I feel I'm a moral imperative uh, as an artist to, to innovate and not to reproduce, uh, you know, past recordings of songs or, uh, um, a musician style of playing the instrument and such. Of course, every musician uh, builds from influences, right? From different musicians uh, and different uh, sort of inspirations. But in my case, what I like to do is to, to innovate using elements from the tradition. And I think for what I've learned, uh, listening to um, amazing you know, uh, musicians uh, in Latin America, this is a, a great way to go. Right to try to find something new out of the materials materials that you already know, and that's kind of uh, how I see my job as as a, as a performer. Okay, let's now uh, take a look to other very important influence in in my life uh, and my music as uh, as a Peruvian born musician. Uh, Por el caminito down the little trail is a piece that. Kind of, I I used to talk about my 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 connections with Andean cultures uh, in Peru and you know um, most countries in South America have uh, uh, regions that are permeated by these ancient cultures you know produce uh, that were born in the in the mountain and in the Andean mountains and these uh, these music cultures have uh, produced amazing music uh, out of the process also of, you know, uh, interacting with uh, European music, European influences, but also um, Afro-derived music. And that's that's uh, one of the things that I wanted to explore with this uh, song, Por, Por el Caminito. Um, one of the things that inspired me were the idea of carnival, celebration, ritual, dance which you can find in many uh, towns and villages in the, in the Andean mountains in Peru and uh, other Andean uh, countries. People use uh, music for specific and powerful social purposes, to gather the community, to, uh, to strengthen the connections of, of members of the community, given that historically Andean cultures have relied in solidarity 
to, to survive, really. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, techniques involving communal work, for instance, have demanded people to learn how to live in peace and harmony with other uh, people uh, in their communities for the sake of, you know, helping each other to survive, right? So solidarity, it's, it's an important element in Andean cultures and their, the music used in Andean cultures uh, many times reinforces this, this aspect, this interconnection of people. So dance, ritual, music are central aspects of um, many Andean cultures. In terms of uh, music, elements like the vocal timbre, for instance, are, are very uh, interesting, um, at least in the, in the Peruvian region of, of the Andes. Uh, people enjoy vocal timbres that are very high pitched, and those things um, have been borrowed by instrumentalists like guitar players and harpists, and sometimes uh, there is use of, of uh, techniques and embellishments that replicate how the, the, the human voice is used in certain styles of Andean music, like for example, this kind of thing. <laughs> It's kind of inspiring the way that Andean singers use their voice to create these embellishments uh, and, and that express uh, sorrow or emotional intensity uh, or joy, different kind of things, right? So in this piece, you'll hear some of, some of that, some of those techniques uh, playing melody. Also, uh, you'll hear, of course, the, 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 the presence of pentatonic sonorities, which are uh, a defining aspect of Andean melodies, the use of the pentatonic scale. The pentatonic scale is really present all around the world. If you think about the blues, it's a pentatonic scale with a few notes in between. But I will play just the, in this song, uh, well, I'll play a, a lot of everything, but I will use uh, uh, the pentatonic scale for the main motifs of this song. And another thing that I introduce uh, in this piece is also my love for the South American rasqueado. Uh, so, when you think about um, flamenco music, for instance, flamenco musicians have used, have created a lot of different techniques to use the hand, the right hand, in my case, uh, right-handed guitar player, to create rhythm and percussive sounds like this. That's a rasgueado that uh, kind of comes from, uh, from Spain and from flamenco traditions, but uh, in many South American countries, there is a distinctive type of rasqueado that, that is uh, indigenous to, to this region. And it has many variations. You can find it in Argentina, you can find it in Chile, in Bolivia, in Peru, uh, in Colombia. And every country and every region has a slightly different variation, but mostly it sounds like this. <laughs> think about uh, the samba in Argentina, the cueca in Chile and Bolivia, uh, marinera in Peru, uh, there are different genres that use this uh, South American rasqueado, which is it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful technique. So I also use elements of this uh, in this uh, piece, Por el Caminito. All right, I hope you like this piece and I will stop sharing. All right.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will take a look at, at your comments uh, in a minute. Thank you very much for um, your comments. Um, how are we doing with time, uh, Carlos? Hey, uh, we said an, an hour and 15, so about we got about maybe 20-ish minutes. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to when it make it too long. I know that Zoom can become yeah, and some you know some people said you know they have to leave, but and yeah. some people have joined, so it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell. But you know we have plenty of people here still, so awesome. <laughs> you keep doing your thing. All right, so I'm gonna uh, move very quickly to my last song. It's actually an arrangement that I did of a of a very uh, very cool uh, jazz song that is many it's many meaningful also um, because uh, the reason that I will explain in a moment. Um, so this uh, tune is called Afro Blue, composed by Mongo Santa, Mar Santa Maria, a Cuban percussionist, uh, and he composed this tune in 1959. Uh, it's meaningful because it's one of, it was the f one of the first uh, um, Latin jazz standards to introduce this uh, rhythmic element. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, that's better now. Um, in, introduce this use of hemiola, which is the combination of two different rhythms uh, overlap with each other. Uh, and this is a, a common feature in Afro-derived music, music that has been inspired by uh, Oriental um, uh, West African uh, uh, genres, right? Um, so this is something that uh, in my arrangement, I, I try to use to, to, to explore how this hemiola element uh, pervades Latin American music and uh, can be used in, in many cool ways to, to create new rhythms and new sensations uh, on the guitar. So I use this arrange, arrangement of Afro Blue as a sort of collage, uh, which I, I always like to do. I, I add elements from different traditions. Some of them you already have heard in the previous songs. I use different rasqueados. I use some flamenco techniques. Uh, I uh, begin with a um, rhythmic feel that is connected to Afro-Peruvian music, especially a genre called festejo, uh, which subdivides every beat into three kind of similar to what happens in jazz, right? So the hemiola him technique, uh, putting together two different rhythms, it's something that always creates a, a very, very nice groove and a nice, uh, nice sensation in the music. Let's listen to a, a part of this song, the original recording of Afro Blue, so you hear how the hemiola works. Here the basic, the basic beat is like this: da da one two three four. But the bass is playing uh, three notes over two, creating a, a combination of two different rhythms. That's what made this song very, you know, uh, very popular. A lot of people enjoyed that that kind of uh, uh, polyvalent rhythm. So if I use my metronome, in this case, you can hear a meter of two, four, one, two, one, two, and I can play uh, three notes on each of these uh, two, four cells like this. It's a very cool trick to create uh, rhythms that are highly danceable and people will uh, really enjoy uh, moving the body with these kind of uh, different rhythmic patterns uh, 
uh, overlapping each other. So that's something that I'll use in this arrangement. Uh, the different in the, in, in the way I conceive this arrangement is that I will subdivide each beat mostly into three, like this. So maybe slower. Right, so every beat will be subdivided into three to make it closer to, to my recollection of uh, festejo in Af Afro-Peruvian music. Uh, and of course, you also will, you will hear in this arrangement uh, a lot of South American rasqueados uh, that, as I said before, I really enjoy to create. Uh, I use them to create momentum, to create energy, uh, and to make people, you know, move their shoulders, you know, which is it's really the, the ultimate goal of this music is to make people dance. It's, it's very, it's intrinsically connected to the, to, uh, to movement and, and the human body. Okay. Here's my arrangement of Afro Blue. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much for listening. Um, that concludes my presentation. So I would love to hear your questions if we still have uh, time for them. Uh, I would love to answer any questions or comments. Um, Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, yeah, so we got about, it looks like, like seven minutes for questions. If anybody wants to unmute and ask any questions. Or, or just any comments, feel free to um, jump in and just make sure you just mute yourself back right after so that way we don't have uh, sound problems. Dr. Rodria, thank you for your music and your time. Quick question. Yeah. I was wondering if, if you have anywhere we can like listen to your music, you know, more than this one time. Yes, uh, I have, uh, if you go to, uh, what's the name? Um, Spotify. You can go to Spotify and I have uh, right now an album that I recorded with my trio, uh, which I recorded in 2019. So if you go and just type Carlos Odria Trio, you'll find that album there. Other questions? Uh, I'm, I'm reading your comments and where is the best place to find your music? Uh, Spotify, I also post a lot of videos um, on my uh, social media, YouTube or Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I love the intimacy of those videos recorded at home. Uh, and it's one of the, the avenues that I use to share my music. Um, so I invite you to, to visit you know, my, my uh, social media accounts and you'll, you'll definitely find music among other things. Um, other questions or comments? Any feedback? Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm not a very, you know, very deep knowledge in music. I don't have that kind of um, uh, ability, but I really enjoyed, you know, I really enjoyed the music. Uh, and thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's a very kind of soothing, calming down and, you know, lots of, uh, you know, energy. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly the things that I, yeah, exactly. I like to convey, convey with my music, you know, uh, uh, good energy yeah. and, and a good feel, rhythm. Exactly. Exactly. Like, um, because, you know, the music, uh, uh, you know, you played the, played the guitar music in such a way that we don't need to, like, uh, know the language, you know, uh, right. people from any, any uh, people from any language, uh, they can enjoy it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. What kind of guitar do you use? Oh, that's such a great topic. Uh, this uh, is my main axe. It's the Godine multi uh, It's It's very popular actually among Latin American guitar players because it has nylon strings, which means that it sounds almost like a classical or flamenco guitar. But it has the beauty 
only of six individual pickups that can be sent uh, to a speaker or to your computer via MIDI, which I'm doing right now. So it's, it's a mixture between tradition and modernity and innovation technology to give you a nice open sound, even though this is a solid body guitar, right? So it's, uh, it's the Godin multi uh, made in Canada. Uh, do you I, have, have I have one more question. This yes. I remember. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, when, when you learned this music, like, uh, did you have, because it has a lot of physics, right? The sound, you know? The physics of sound, uh, right? Uh, like frequency, intensity, like sounds, velocity. So, did you have to learn those uh, physics of music, or just um, you learned it in what is that called art point of view? Do you mean if I, if I I use the physics of of music? Yeah. Did you, do you did you have to study uh, physics of uh, uh, you know sound? Uh, a, a little kind of bit, a little bit, but not in, in, in a deep way as a scientist will do. I definitely it, the the knowing of how uh, music works in terms of the physics physics have opened my eyes in relation of how important is the human body in in, okay. in, in terms of you know how. Uh, the frequencies of music af affect and inform not only the ear but the entire body. You know, so there's exactly a, yeah. There is a physicality of music that is very important. Yeah, the physics and biology, like you know how how it affects the neuro, and like our uh, you know neural system. You know, right. lots of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Other questions or comments? We're almost uh, out of time, but. Uh, Thank you very much. I've seen some uh, great questions such as, you know, one about cultural appropriation. I wish I, I, I have more time to, to discuss this important uh, topic, uh, but I think we're running out of uh, time. I want to thank everyone for, for being here, for inviting me to play, to share my music. Thanks for listening. And um, I can share with you my uh, contact information if you want to get in contact with me, you know, with questions or any feedback, I would love to, to hear your comments. Awesome, thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, on, on behalf of, you know, Futuro, you know, everybody at Tennessee Tech, we have people from Florida State as well. Uh, awesome. We wanna thank you for, for your time. And, uh, you know, it was a great, uh, I think it was a great presentation. I recorded it as well, so I will share that link with you. And I will make it available to whoever missed out. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us. If there is uh, no more questions, you guys uh, are free to head out. And if you have any questions about Carlos Rodriguez's contact, you can also contact me or Dorota, and we can, you know, uh, arrange that so you guys can reach out to him um, on your own. Muchas gracias a todos. Un abrazo. Gracias, gracias Carlos. Cuídense.